Welcome to Intention. This is Byron Delir. I'm very excited today to bring you a very special voice, a special episode of Intention. Now, for my listeners and viewers, I know there's been quite a bit of time between episodes. This is because of other commitments. So, I just want you to know that I really appreciate your loyalty and patience, and I'd like to think it's about quality and not so much about quantity. Well, you're in for a treat with this one. Last February, I helped organize and was honored to speak at the St. Louis City NAACP Civil Rights Conference. And now, in partnership with the NAACP, we bring you a poignant and moving talk by one of the nation's finest legal minds, Debo Adegbele. But this speech is not lawyerly, no. This presentation is an emotional tour de force through the history of American civil rights. And if you're listening to the audio-only podcast, please take the time to pull up our YouTube channel and see the short film that accompanies the talk. You'll also hear from my dear friend Adolphus Pruitt, president of the St. Louis City NAACP, sharing the impactful and momentous history of the St. Louis chapter of our nation's largest civil rights organization. This episode was a labor of love, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I did in pulling it together. days ahead and it seemed like we're still fighting the same fights we fought 60 years ago when you're talking about voter rights. Everybody, good morning. It is approximately 9.52, so everybody's on time. In case you thought you were late, you're on time. My name is Adolphus Pruitt. I'm the president of St. Louis City NAACP. Uh, We have a long and storied history, 110 years here in the city of St. Louis. Uh, 
you go back and look at our history, you'll see that just about every significant civil rights achievement in the city of St. Louis, uh, this branch uh, led or in some ways uh, started and completed uh, that effort into its fruition. I mean, we can go back from uh, the desegregation of public housing to the school desegregation lawsuits. Uh, we participated in uh, any number of of, of civil rights activities. As a matter of fact, just as a side note, and we'd love to talk about it, is that the Gaines, the Laura Gaines case, which African-American male in the city of St. Louis graduated and wanted to go to Mizzou Law School, which was, of course, all white at that time, and they denied him. And in order, when they lost in court, in order to keep from having him in that school, they established a black law school in the Ville neighborhood, Lincoln Law School, just to keep that from happening. And he refused to attend that segregated law school and continued to fight. And uh, eventually, uh, University of Missouri and Columbia's law school had to uh, accept him. Well, the, in the local NACP, our attorneys led that fight along with our national office. And one of the attorneys that helped the local NACP with that lawsuit, believe it or not, was Thurgood Marshall. And it was the, it was a legal strategy in that lawsuit that ultimately became the foundation for Brown versus Board of Education. And so there's a lot of, of history of, of civil rights and activism done by the NACP locally here in St. Louis that has some very uh, uh, story national implications and outcomes if uh, just to just to name those few. What what this experiment today is about, we've done these many conferences before. And what this experiment today is about is that, you know, oftentimes when we take positions and take directions about issues impacting people of color or issues that are far right within the mission of the NAACP, you know, folks sometimes wonder, where do we get the basis of our information? Where was the foundation for our thinking and, and going in that direction? And sometimes we share it and sometimes uh, we let the data speak for itself. But this experiment, this mini conference this time around was to bring the source, the sources we rely on, the experts that we rely on to the table and let them share directly with you the intellectual property, the, the wonderful and amazing work that they have done in studying these issues. And then so now when we pick up the mantle locally and start fighting and come up with strategies as relates to those issues, how they impact folk here in St. Louis and the St. Louis region. He's going to give each and every one of you the opportunity to follow along uh, succinctly with what are we doing and why are we doing it, because you would have been here first. You, you would have got the, the same information. The information you're going to hear today, we'd be hearing for the first time ourselves. We've read up on it, done our research, but it's, we will also, this is our deep dive into having conversations with the with the source material with the, and and from there we would develop some strategies and some directions and and we're going to come out the box fighting and that's why this year's theme is transforming communities through education social action and civic engagement and in some cases the day is a combination of all three because you're going to get the education uh, and the education is definitely going to speak about uh, social justice and 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 definitely will lead to uh, some of the conversations about how we engage based on what we hear. So without any further ado, uh, we have four discussions. We like to call them discussions. Uh, we're not here to speak at you. We're here to have a conversation. We want you to sit back and relax in the staying in stream labs of you at home. Sit back and just relax and hear, hear from the folk who we rely on for our information. And then let's see if at, at the end of the day, if uh, we all come back with the same understanding.
Our first speaker is Debo Adegbele. And as you can tell, I did not do well in English. But he's a partner with Wilmer Hill LP, and he's also a commissioner in the US uh, Civil Rights uh, Commission. Um, He's held this position with the law firm since 2002. He previously from 2013 and 2014 was senior counsel to the chairman of the United States Senate Judiciary Committee. And let, let me repeat that. So we understand who we're talking to. He was senior counsel to the chairman of the United States Senate Judiciary Committee. Prior to the Senate Judiciary Committee, for over a decade, he held a number of leadership roles in the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, the Educational Fund, uh, LDF, including acting president and director of litigation. During his time at the LDF, uh, he argued two of the most significant civil rights cases in decades before the US Supreme Court. So we, we got somebody who's arguing before the court, not the local court, not the municipal court, not the circuit court, I think he said the United States Supreme Court. Uh, also, uh, um, both cases involved constitutional challenges to the core provisions of the Voting Rights Act. And prior to joining the ADF, LDF, he was also associated at Paul Weiss, Rinklin, Wharton, and Garrison. He received his BA from Connecticut College and his JD from New York University School of Law. Uh, without any further ado, Mr. Debo, that podium is yours. Thank you so much. It's good to be with you. Good morning. Mr. Pruitt, thank you for the generous introduction. It's always great to join my friends at the NAACP as I have during my career across the country on so many important fights for justice and for civil rights. Today, I'm here to share some reflections on some of my work in various areas that I hope have some resonance with things that you all are thinking about, have worked on, care about, and are fighting for. It's but one measure of the commitment that the NAACP has, and it was wonderful to hear some of the history of this historic branch. Um, but it's, it's a wonderful um, emphasis here to sort of see that so many people are out uh, this early in the dog days of winter, cold winter day, to uh, on a Saturday morning to come and, and be engaged in the active work of civil rights and reflecting on equality, and I thank you for it. And I know the NAA has been at it for more than 100 years, and we will be at it, I suspect, for another 100 years, or as long as it takes. Um, today, my topic, as you have seen, is how democracy is forged by the fight for civil rights, reflections on voting, higher education, and policing. What, what I want to do is examine the ways in which the nation itself is shaped by the work that you do, that the NAACP does, that so many brave people across the country do to lift up participation in voting, access to education, public safety at the same time as guaranteeing human dignity in our neighborhoods and on the streets. Um, we know that the nation makes promises to all of us. We know that our great documents make promises about how life is supposed to be in America. And we set our aims very high. I've spent my life engaged in different ways with the core issues in civil rights and democracy that relate to these very things voter access and participation, expanding educational opportunity, and working to ensure that law enforcement is bounded by the rule of law and accountability in the discharge of its public safety duties. And through the years, through the cases, 
through the legislative advocacy, through the grassroots work, I've gained a perspective on what connects the work across these different substantive areas. In America, we must confront the notion that the Constitution makes high promises, but too often on the ground, we're faced with low practices. There's too often a wide gap between the high promises of equal protection of the laws, due process of the law, and the low practices of discrimination, deprivations of opportunity, and due process through these low practices. I regard the work of civil rights advocates really across all of the different areas as a steadfast and unwavering quest to narrow the gap between the high promises and low practices. That's the thing that holds them together. Whatever, whatever area you're working in, we say we do something and that we're going to do something, but too often we do something else. And the way that I think about the fight for civil rights is to shrink that space between what we promise and what we do. The charge to make the union more perfect is aspirational. It's a guidepost and a national and enduring goal. It tells us two things about the democracy. First, that it requires work, engagement, and tending. Our democracy is not self-executing. It takes people to put their shoulder to the grindstone. We must be unsatisfied with the status quo and where we are today. That's the first thing that I hear when I hear about a more perfect union. Don't be satisfied, it can be better. Relatedly, and second, this aspirational idea tells us that tomorrow can be better than today. But it can only be so if all of us, or at least many of us, do the work, put in the work. And that's what this branch does. That's what the NAA does. It's in this sense that the fight for civil rights forges American democracy. And I think that's true whether you understand the word forge to connote shaping by heat and fire, or more simply creating new conditions. With this framework in mind, I'd like to consider how some of the work that is played out over time in the areas of voting, access to higher ed and policing. Um, and again, in each of these situations, we must look backward to understand where we are today and the road ahead, because history tells us something about the current context. I'll, I'll begin with voting. This is perhaps the easiest way to understand the link between civil rights and the democracy itself, of course, because voting is about the fundamental way in which we participate in democracy itself. And so when we think about we the people, it is voting that gives the voice to we the people. It's our votes exercised in local elections, in federal elections, in presidential elections, in school board elections that help set the country on its path and pick the people that are to lead us. And so this is sort of the common denominator of democracy, our votes. It's also perhaps the best context in which to understand this framework that I've offered about high promises and low practices. And you may ask why, but of course we know that after the civil war, the nation passed three great amendments, the so-called reconstruction amendments to the constitution that were designed to protect the rights and citizenship of those formerly held in bondage. The amendments, the Reconstruction Amendments, like forging, invoke the image of repairing something that is broken and creating something new, new conditions. One of those amendments, the 15th Amendment specifically, was about voting. It was specifically addressed to bridging the divide in that context and to opening up the polling places to Black Americans who had been excluded. But as you consider the aims of the 15th Amendment and you, and you look at the words and you think about what it was intended to do, what we have to confront is that for nearly 100 years, it was a dead letter. It was words, they were words on a page, but they were not the practices that we lived by. We know this because we know our history. 
And we know that wide swaths of the country were enmeshed in Jim Crow, in systemic exclusion. And Jim Crow was not justice. Jim Crow was segregation, separation, and broken promises. Black voters were systemically excluded. Political participation was, was not real. And we didn't experience what Abraham Lincoln had called the new birth of freedom, which was the hope that would be on the other side of the Civil War, the hope and the aim of those Reconstruction Amendments that were trying to build a new reality. It was justice denied, not justice experienced. And so we, the people, had a problem. And so what changed? The fight for minority voting rights is the example of how perseverance, heat, pressure, steadfastness can bend the arc toward justice. We think of Selma, Alabama. We always go back to Selma when we think about voting rights. We think of Selma, Alabama. We think of the Edmund Pettus Bridge. We think of it, and it has been called a bridge to freedom. We often speak of it in that way, and we'll speak of it that way today. But I said we're going to consider history to understand our present circumstances. So I'm not going to begin with the Edmund Pettus Bridge. I'm going to begin with another moment in Selma, Alabama, that's too often forgotten. The other moment that I want to speak about today in Selma, Alabama, was the so-called Battle of Selma. The Battle of Selma was one of the key battles of the Civil War. It was a battle where the Confederacy had its back broken and was in retreat. It was a battle that was led by a Confederate general on the Confederate side whose name was Nathan Bedford Forrest. That's a name some of you may know. But for those of you who don't know, what you, what you need to know is that Nathan Bedford Forrest was the founder of the Ku Klux Klan. He was known as being a brutal warrior. And he was turned back by the Union forces in Selma, Alabama. The Confederacy was sent retreating. They were cut off from all of the armaments and access that they needed to fight the war. And it was a decisive battle during the Civil War. And so the Battle of Selma was, in a sense, the first bridge to freedom. It's said in the history books that after the Battle of Selma, many of the African Americans in that town sort of walked out of Selma and began to march forward with the Union soldiers to fight the battles that would come. And so when I think of the Edmund Pettus Bridge, I don't begin in 1965. I don't begin in 1965, but I think of Nathan Bedford Forrest and what it took to stop the fight of the Confederacy in the Civil War, and that created the circumstances that later would allow John Lewis and so many other brave souls on the Edmund Pettus Bridge to meet Sheriff Jim Clark. What we need to know about the march in Selma is that it wasn't an accident that the Voting Rights March turned to Selma. They knew their adversary. Their adversary in Selma, Jim Clark, was known, perhaps not unlike General Nathan Bedford Forrest was known, for being an, an irascible and a violent person. They knew that if they had the courage to confront him, he would react. They knew this as they stepped out on the bridge. It's kind of hard to understand the bravery and the commitment and the unwavering, um, unyielding uh, commitment to justice that people had to have to know what you have coming on the other side and yet to march forward and, and, and do it. We need to reflect on that. And so they chose that place. They chose confronting this person because it was too important not to. And how did that march in Selma come about? It came about because there was an earlier march in that same part of town where a young military veteran, Jimmy Lee Jackson, had risen to defend his family his grandmother and mother who had been set upon by a state trooper who was violently accosting them. And Jimmy Lee Jackson rose to defend his family and he was shot by the state trooper for defending his kinfolk from violence, state-sponsored violence. And he later died in the hospital, Jimmy Lee Jackson. And his brothers and sisters in Selma were so upset that this young man's life had been taken that Hosea Williams said, we should take his casket and we should march it all the way to Montgomery. It was a visceral reaction of dealing with the loss of a brave soul who just wanted to vote. And that was the idea. That was where the idea came from. So even before they were on the bridge, their people had laid down their lives for the right to vote. And that march came out of the movement. And it's important to wind it back and think about what were these steps that catalyzed the next steps, right? How did we get there? 
And so the march was a, was a tribute to Jimmy Lee Jackson and people moved forward. And what did it do? It, it changed the dynamic. It created a situation where LBJ, who was then president, Lyndon Johnson, he had said to Martin Luther King shortly before this, Martin Luther King had come back from winning the Nobel Peace Prize. And he had a meeting with the president in the White House. And Martin Luther King didn't want to talk about the award. He wanted to talk about the fight for voting. This is before Selma. And he wanted to tell the president that we need a federal voting measure because of what was going on in the Deep South. And President Johnson said at that time that the nation was tired of civil rights. And the reason was because we had just passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And that had taken political capital to get that bill across. And so LBJ was saying, we're, we, we can't do it right now. The nation is tired. And he said, you have to go create the circumstances for the next push. And so Selma was the catalytic response to say, OK, if we have to do it, we'll do it. We'll find a way to make it happen. The people will find a way to make it happen. And I don't know if you remember this, but in the election when Barack Obama was facing Hillary Clinton, the presidential election in the Democratic primary, they got in a little spat about whether it was the um, activists and the, and the people that brought us the Voting Rights Act or whether it was the politicians and, and, and the president that brought us, uh, brought us the Voting Rights Act. And of course, history tells us that it was both. Both were, were, were very significant, right? On the one hand, you need to create the circumstances. You need to make the case. On the other hand, you need somebody to come forward with the bill. And after that march, LBJ went from saying the country was tired of civil rights to going before a joint session of Congress, both houses together, and giving what was regarded by the civil rights activists, by John Lewis. I've heard, I heard the late, great John Lewis talk about this, listening to this speech before he passed. And it was regarded as one of the best civil rights speeches that a politician had ever given. And he invoked the words of the movement. He used in his speech the, the words, we shall overcome, which stunned the audience, that, that they had brought the country to this place where we were going to have a Voting Rights Act. And we did. The Voting Rights Act was passed because of what was done. There is no Negro problem. There is no Southern problem. There is no Northern problem. There is only an American problem. It is the effort of American Negroes to secure for themselves the full blessings of American life. Their cause must be our cause too. Because it's not just Negroes, but really it's all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice. And we shall overcome. It was passed because they brought the country, it, they brought it into the living rooms of the country and they showed the inhumanity. They showed the gap between the high promises and the low practices. They made the country confront the reality. And the Voting Rights Act was so important in watershed. Why? Because it was the first time that there was an effective federal commitment to the minority inclusion principle in the democracy. Right, I told you we had the 15th Amendment that said everybody was supposed to be able to vote without regard to race, but it was a dead letter in many places in the country. It's not until the Voting Rights Act that we begin to deliver on that promise that we become a democracy, a meaningful democracy, where we get to hear from we the people in elections. So that movement, that story from the Battle of Selma in the Civil War to what happened on the bridge, to LBJ going to Congress, to passing the Voting Rights Act, that is a story of forging democracy. It didn't happen by itself. People had to actively engage in the work of making the union live up to its promises. And the Voting Rights Act was so important because it was effective. In a sense, there's a provision of the Voting Rights Act I wanna to talk to you about that is one of the most honest descriptions of how discrimination was experienced ever in the United States. This was the so-called pre-clearance provision of the Voting Rights Act. And let me tell you what it did. The pre-clearance provision said that because there have been some parts in the country where the resistance to allowing black people and minority voters to vote and participate has been so entrenched 
so adaptive. You have a case, you get a court order, you stop the illegal practice, and then they figure out a new way, they come with a new measure to, to achieve the same end of blocking people from voting. Because the discrimination in some parts of the country had proven so persistent and adaptive, they said, we need a new rule. We need a new protection. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna say that some parts of the country where we've seen this type of discrimination over and over again, commitment to disenfranchisement, we're gonna put in place a protection that says you cannot change any voting law until you come forward and show that it doesn't discriminate against minority voters, right? Ordinarily, legislatures pass laws and then it's for the people, for this branch, for other folks to decide, does the law infringe on a right? And brave people like Lloyd Gaines, who sadly I have to report, was never seen again after that case. We know that history, right? Lloyd Gaines came forward in the Gaines case, but Gaines didn't get the benefit of his ruling. And the, the, the truth may never be known about what happened to Mr. Gaines, but people have, have left their life, let their lives down on the line for these things. So people have to come forward in cases, but the preclearance provision says, we are going to presume that bad things may happen. Why? Because bad things have so often happened that we're gonna make you come forward and show it doesn't just, that you're not discriminating. If you make that showing, then the law can go into place. But this isn't just laws, it's also small voting changes. And let me explain the difference. A redistricting plan or a map or something that changes who can vote or what ID you need to vote, those are laws, right? They're passed as laws. But there are other ways that you can manipul manipulate elections short of changing a law. How? You can be an election official that closes down a polling place where people have voted for decades on the eve of an election, within weeks of the election. You can narrow the number of polling places that are available. You can do that in some neighborhoods, but not other neighborhoods to make it harder to vote. You can move polling places to places that are remote where there isn't public transportation. And so what, what happened was that there were so many different ways to stop people from voting. You needed a law that touched not, you, you needed a protection that touched not just laws, but any type of voting change. And that's what preclearance did. It was very effective because if it was discriminatory, it got knocked away before it could take effect. It was a front end answer, not a back end after people have been discriminated against. And it was terribly effective. So what was the history of this terribly effective provision? The history was that every time it got passed or reauthorized by Congress, because originally it was for five years, there was a, a constitutional challenge trying to take it down. The record was clear about why we needed it, but every time there would be a case that would go to the Supreme Court trying to take it down. And from 1966 all the way to 2013, the Supreme Court always upheld it. And they said that it was necessary, it was important that Congress was using the power under the 15th Amendment that the people had given to Congress to protect minority voting rights, that discrimination was evident, that this measure was helpful in blocking and deterring discrimination, that people in these states and jurisdictions that have faced so much discrimination were benefiting from it. We had seen changes and elected offices began to change. People of color were able to elect the candidates of their choice often for the first time, people got registered and it, it was a story of forging democracy, making the inclusion principle real in American democracy. And then we reauthorized the act in, in 2006 to give it 25 more years. And then there was a case that came to the Supreme Court that was called Shelby County. That was, that was one of the cases that I argued in the Supreme Court. And one of the themes of forging democracy is that the old fights never die. The old fights never die. I told you that each time this law was passed, there would be a challenge. And the challenge was pretty much the same. If you look back at the challenge in 1966 and you think about the challenge in, in 2013, it's not really different. They're talking about the harm to the jurisdiction, the harm to the states, the, the difficulty of being subjected to this. And you don't often hear about the harm to the voters that are being discriminated against and have been. You don't hear about the 100 years before there was the Voting Rights Act. You don't hear enough, although Congress made a record, about all the discrimination that this act stopped. You just hear about the states complaining about being subjected to a provision that's designed to make people vote. And what they said is that too much time had passed, that things had changed, and ultimately the court declared unconstitutional 
that preclearance provision of the Voting Rights Act. I argued that case and I tried to convey to the court that the record that Congress assembled tells us that if you do this, there will be more discrimination. That Congress looked at it and they saw that two things were true. One, that things had changed, there was progress, but that we needed more progress and that the threats were still there. That's what we told the court, that it does, you don't have to have a, a, a very simple idea about the way the world is. Two things can be true, right? We don't have to be in the 1965 condition where people are being murdered to vote in order to still need protections so that people can continue to vote. And so we were able and, and could understand that in some ways a great deal has changed. In other ways, a great deal hasn't. Thus, we need the protection. But the court saw it a different way. And in Shelby County, they struck down that provision of the Voting Rights Act, the preclearance provision. One of the most important acts of Congress of any kind, not just a civil rights law. The Voting Rights Act is considered one of the most important acts of Congress of any kind in the history of the country. Supreme Court declares it unconstitutional. The Senate had voted 98 to zero to give us 25 more years of protection. Supreme Court says it's unconstitutional. What happens is the next question. What happens on that day? Texas and North Carolina put out laws to reduce access for minority voters on the day that the ruling was declared on the day. So you didn't need to you didn't need a crystal ball. You didn't need to be a voting lawyer. You didn't need to litigate the cases. All you needed to do was be a student of history and know that some of the old battles are with us. That's all you needed to do. It was in the record. It was in the briefs on that day. It happened. And Justice Ginsburg, who dissented in that case, she said that striking down this provision is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. That's what she said. She said, striking this provision is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. Meaning the protection is doing the work it's supposed to do. Don't take it away. But the court struck it down. And what have we seen on the backside of that? There are two things that we've seen. One, the protection isn't there. So we've seen more measures trying to make it harder for people to vote in those places where it used to operate. That's terrible, that's bad. But there's another thing which is a little bit more subtle, but I think as cancerous to the democracy as the fact that they took away the protection. It also was the Supreme Court of the United States signaling that we were in retreat from the federal commitment to the minority protection principle that we had fought so hard for. And that signal went around the nation and allowed people to say, hey, maybe we can try to do some of the things that we haven't been able to do. Maybe we can have more bills that are trying to, to, to fight to block people. And why is that important? Why is that important? It's important for this reason. There are two ways to win elections in America. There are two traditions of elections in America and both can be effective. This is something we have to really focus on. One is mobilization and motivation and getting people excited, registered, leading, and having people follow your vision. That's one way to win elections, right? Get people excited, get them out to vote, do the work, do the grassroots work, have them come out for you. Voter mobilization, lead with an example, and people sign on to that vision. That is democracy's high road. But what is the other road? The other road is demobilization. Put barriers in the way. Try and block your opponent's voters from having their voices heard. Try to redefine we the people to not be all the people, but some of the people. That's democracy's low road. What we need to take cognizance of is that both of those can be effective. We wish it weren't the case, but that is the case. That's the experience. And this fight about the Voting Rights Act and the signaling effect is inviting people to go on democracy's low road. And that's why the work of forging the democracy where there's an action and a reaction continues. And we know that there are bills in Congress trying to fix some of this. The votes aren't there yet, but that work continues. The work of this branch in making the case about why we need these protections is vital. And it's an intergenerational fight. So that we don't get it in the moment doesn't mean that we don't continue to look for it, that we don't continue to fight for it, that we don't look for that window of opportunity where there is that crystallizing event that changes things and aligns people to do the work. These are some of the lessons of voting. This is why the, the, the history of voting all the way back from the 
reconstruction from the civil war to the current fights, you see a continuity. You see that the old fights are new. You see that the old practices continue. And we think about that. I wanna turn quickly to higher education and talk a little bit about it. So there is a case now in the Supreme Court that is challenging whether race can be one of the things that admissions officers consider when people apply to college. Now, as you know, when people apply to college, they tell their story. They tell their personal narrative. The main essay that people write is called a personal statement, right? It's kind of a declaration of who are you and, and what are your aspirations? What are your dreams? What are you interested in? What will you contribute um, to, our, to our institution? What do you want to study? What got you here? What brought you this far, right? These are the essays that these 17, 18 year olds write. And part of that for many people in America is to tell the story of what their experience has been as a black person in America, as a Latinx person in America, as an Asian American person in America. What is that context? What is that, what is that cultural richness? What are the experiences? Have you been, have you, your, has your educational experience been met with discrimination in some way that, that caused you to, to learn some things about yourself and the nation? that has shaped your aspiration or your, your ability to, to cope and navigate in the space. This is part of people's story, not everybody. Some people are writing about that. Some people are gonna write about wanting to be an engineer or how they throw a football or that they play the cello and that's all great. But where it's relevant to people, where they wanna talk about that experience, where that can add something to the mix, folks should be able to talk about it. And schools recognize this. And so many schools have what's called a whole person test where they want to know everything about you and hear and see it all in the mix. And it, these are competitive processes when people um, apply to college because there are more people that apply than there are beds and, and seats for the residential colleges. There are lots of different types of colleges, but for now, let's, let's uh, focus on the residential colleges. Uh, I recognize that there's a wide swath and a, and a range of ways that people get their higher education. And so these cases, this case, this Harvard case, that I'll mention again in a second, is about whether or not schools can continue to consider race at all, or whether they have to act as if they're blind to it and not allow it to be a consideration, not to be part of the narrative, which would leave us in a situation where you could talk about everything and anything else, but not that. Think about that today in America. A rule elevated to a constitutional principle by the Supreme Court that would tell colleges and universities and admissions officers that you can talk about anything you want to talk about, but don't talk about race. Not relevant, not part of the story in America, right? It's, it sounds crazy when you say it, but this is, this is what this case is presenting. And again, history repeats itself. The first case that raised this issue was in the 1970s. Baki, Baki, Adolphus is calling it out. The Baki case at University of California system. Alan Bakke didn't get into the medical school and he complained that one of the considerations was race. Yeah, Alan Bakke was a white guy who was applying to go to the, go to the uh, university, go to the medical school and he didn't get in and he brought a case suggesting that he, he had been discriminated against. And in that case, the court said some interesting things and set some things down, which are interesting as we think about the historical context. First, they said that whatever schools do when they're considering diversifying the student body, and this is in the 1970s, not too far from the 1960s and the civil rights movement, right? 1976 or so, right? What they said at that time is you can't have a quota, meaning the school can't say we want this many of um, white folks, we want this many of black folks. You can't, have a, you can't have a crude quota. You can't have a specific number. That's not the way that we can do it because that's inconsistent with equal protection of the law, because then you may not be looking at the individuals, you may just be filling, filling the numbers, right? So they took off the table at that time in the 1970s quotas in higher education. It's impermissible, it's unconstitutional. They said something else in that decision. The court said that the schools can't be responding to broad societal discrimination. That, that the admissions plans, the, what you're trying to do in admissions can't be trying to cure broad-based societal discrimination. So the way that lawyers understand that is that the court kind of took off the table a remedial rationale for why race should be considered in admissions. Essentially, there's been discrimination in higher education. We know the Brown case. 
We're still contending with that legacy. Schools have been segregated K to 12. There, 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 many schools are still racially identifiable as a result of residential segregation and the whole history of discrimination in America. So although there is no rule of law that says that you, you, uh, you can't go to school with folks that don't look like you anymore, there's still the practice. There's still the practice on the ground of the way life is experienced. But the court said, and, and by the way, part of that practice is that the schools are unequal that some schools are better than other schools and that the resources and, and sometimes the, the teaching is not at, up to snuff in all of the schools, right? And so there's inequality, there's educational inequality, but what the court is saying in 1976 is, look, you can't, you can't be responding to that when you're dealing with admissions. You have to look at the individual, you have to sort of consider the whole person, look at all of those features, essentially do what schools are doing today. That was blessed in Baki. And so you were left with this idea that diversity and having people together in college from different perspectives and walks of life has some educational benefits that a school can choose to do that. But the rationale that will be recognized under the constitution is not, you can't have a quota, you can't have a strict number, you can't be remedying longstanding societal inequality in education. It's the diversity of the student body which gives educational benefits that is gonna become the rationale. And this gets tested over and over again. So it was tested again in the Michigan cases. There were two cases out of the University of Michigan, one in the law school and one in the undergraduate school that presented the same types of issues in the 2000s. And essentially what the court ruled is that the way that the undergraduate was doing it was unconstitutional, was too close to a quota. They weren't considering the whole person. They weren't looking at the individual. So the undergraduate plan got struck down, but they upheld the law school plan that was looking at all of the features, considering race as one of many factors. And so it continued. And then what happened? We had another one at the University of Texas. Why did we have that one? We had that one because in Texas, there was a ruling that said that you couldn't consider race anymore from a lower federal court. And so in Texas, you couldn't do it the way that so many schools were doing it. So what did the Texas legislature do? The Texas legislature said, we're gonna have a top 10% plan. The top 10% of any high school can go to the University of Texas system. And you're, you might be asking, well, how does that solve the problem of diversity in higher ed? How, how is that a response to taking away the consideration of race and admissions? I go back to the earlier point, because we still have residential segregation, because our schools are still um, racially identifiable because of the history of discrimination and segregation in, in states like Texas and really all around, the country in, in large measure. Um, when you have a top 10% plan that allows the top 10% of all the high schools to gain admission, you're gonna have some diversity because the schools themselves are black high schools, Latinx high schools, white high schools. So it's a way to get diversity in the UT system that relies on the history of discrimination and the current day effects of it but it's not considering race, right? It's race neutral because you're not putting race in the room. You're just saying, we're gonna take the top 10%. And so, so that was deemed okay, right? So what happens in Texas? After the Michigan cases are decided, Texas says, look, we're doing all right with this system, but we still have a need as a, a, Texas is a minority majority state now, it's a very diverse state. They said, we still have a need to do some of the old style too, and to consider the whole person. So most of the admits came through the top 10%, but for some, they were gonna use this consideration where they were gonna consider race. And so people bring a case against that part of the Texas plan, that part where you're considering race. They say, look, you already have diversity because of the top 10% plan. Why are you introducing race here? You have a race neutral way to have diversity. Why are you trying to add it here? It's unnecessary. And that case goes to the Supreme Court. But this is an important case because it's a case that brings the old Brown cases together with the modern higher ed cases. Why? Because one of the cases that led to Brown, we talked about the Gaines case, was Sweat v. Painter. Sweat v. Painter was a case where a black mail carrier from Texas wanted to go to law school. They wouldn't let him go to law school. They said he had to sit outside. In a, in, a, in, a, in a separate room, they wouldn't let Heman Sweat go to the law school and they brought a case and Thurgood Marshall uh, litigated that case and led that case. And in the 1950s before Brown, Sweat v. Painter was one of the cases that led to Brown being decided. And where was it? It was at the University of Texas. And who was defending segregation and keeping Heman Sweat out in that case? 
the University of Texas, the flagship institution in the state of Texas. But fast forward to the Fisher case, the case I talked about attacking the other piece of the top 10% plan, who was defending diversity in higher ed? The state of Texas. The state of Texas over time had switched positions and had decided that this was important for their flagship institution. And so they were defending the use of race. So you see how democracy is forged and over time, there are different conceptions of opportunity. And what happened in the Fisher case, the descendants, the relatives of Heman Sweat, now deceased, wrote a brief to talk about the family story of what Heman Sweat being able to go to school has led to for his entire family and kinfolk to project forward to show what the evil of segregation was, but the opportunity that was created as the result of opening up educational opportunity for him to aspire to his dreams. And they filed a brief in that Fisher case. And everybody said, as they had said in the Michigan cases, the court's gonna take it away, but no, they didn't. And they didn't take it away again in, in Fisher, University of Texas cases. And so we go forward. Now we have the Harvard case. And the court just decided they're gonna hear the Harvard case. And I've been participating in defending Harvard's consideration of race as one of many factors, same thing, same type of challenge. Um, that case is gonna be heard in the Supreme Court in October. The court's different now. And folks are again concerned about what the result will be. But we won that case at trial and the evidence was on our side. They said a lot of things. They accused Harvard of discrimination. There was a group of an, an organization of Asian American um, applicants who claimed that they were being discriminated against by Harvard and they claimed intentional discrimination and that um, Harvard shouldn't be able to consider race as one of the factors. But after the evidence was heard by a trial judge, the judge rejected categorically all of those allegations. Then they appealed it. The appellate court rejected all of those allegations. Now the Supreme Court is going to take it up again and may revisit that precedent that goes back to Bakke and the 1970s. We're, we're going to fight to defend that case. We're working on the briefs as we speak. My partner, Seth Waxman, will argue that case in the Supreme Court and will defend it with every fiber of our being. But you see how what's old is new and the fights continue. It just keeps coming back from Bakke to the Michigan cases, to the Texas case, to the Harvard case. I should mention that there's another case that's gonna be argued on the same day as a Harvard case, which is attacking the University of North Carolina's admission system. They brought the, those two cases to be argued together. And the question is, are we keeping the pathway open for everybody to go to college? Are we closing off doors? There was testimony in the Harvard case about if you take away the consideration of race, how precipitously the admission of black and Latinx students will go down. Harvard's a, a one of the best institutions, higher ed institutions in the world. They depend on diversity for people to learn from each other. And there was testimony about it. Ruth Simmons, who, was the first black president of an Ivy League institution. She was president of Brown University. She's now president of Prairie View A&M and HBCU in Texas, where she went home to be with her kinfolk. I, I spoke to Ruth Simmons and she told the joke that she, she's had an extraordinary career, You know, one of the leading academics and, and uh, presidents, academic administrators, thinkers uh, in, in the country. And she said that uh, her, her family was never impressed with any of her jobs until she retired and then came home to be president of, uh, of Prairie View A&M. That was in Texas and that was something they could talk about. All that fancy stuff in those remote states was not, uh, not, not something no, noteworthy. But when she came back home, uh, that was something that was, that was a big deal. And Ruth Simmons was our expert in the Harvard case. And, and she talked about how important it is for people to learn um, from each other. She knows she's been um, a president of higher ed institutions, HBCUs, uh, Ivy League institutions. Um, and she talked about it and, she, and she, she was able to talk about it in a way that was so captivating for one reason, or many reasons, but there's one that I wanna to point to today. Ruth Simmons is the human personification of the difference that educational opportunity can make. Why you ask? She grew up in segregated Texas, in segregation. Um, she didn't have a lot of educational opportunities early on. She was in a very big family, but some people noted that she had extraordinary abilities and they looked after her. They got her into some good schools. As a young woman, she decided she wanted to learn about a different context than segregation. And before she went to college, she went to study in Mexico briefly and learned to speak Spanish. Um, she then became an expert in romance languages and traveled the world, got degrees and high honors in France. And she lived the experience 
from segregation to being the first black president of an Ivy League institution, it was the full sweep of that aspiration of what the fights of Brown v. Board were about. And she's seen it not only in her own life, but she's seen the difference that it's made for students. And so she was such a compelling witness. Sometimes you're in a trial and not all witnesses are the same. There's some that are difference makers. And when Ruth Simmons was on the stand, you could see the judge had rapt attention. And if you don't believe me, you can look up the opinion of the trial judge in, in, the, in the court because that judge started with a quote from Ruth Simmons. She dropped a footnote to say that she was the most compelling witness in the trial. And then she ends her opinion, which is well over 100 pages, with a quote from Ruth Simmons. She kind of bookended the story of the trial because she put it in context. And what she said is that it's part of America's work, that this is part of the American experiment, creating these opportunities and access is about the country itself, that we need leaders educated from every walk of life and experience. She said, it is, this is Ruth Simmons speaking at the trial. It's very hard for me to overstate my conviction about the benefits that flow from all of these areas to a diverse student body. I know what it was like to walk down the streets where, people's, where we face people's attacks or they issued racial slurs. She was talking about the sweep of the American experiment in American history, and she was able to put it in a context to make it real. She was working on forging democracy. She says this issue about allowing people to go to school together is about not just today, but the future of the democracy, to have leaders educated that are prepared for our times. This is what she told the court, and the, and the court recognized it. Yes, sir. Do you think the colored students will show up? If I got anything to do with it, they won't show up. Well, I think it's a breaking point of the school integration. I just don't uh, feel that they have a right to go to school. This is Central High School, Little Rock, Arkansas. Troops, which for nearly three weeks lined the sidewalk here in front of the high school under orders to keep the colored students out, have been replaced now from their orders to comply with the law, which means let the Negro students in if they come in. I close with some reflections on policing. Policing and law enforcement is an issue that is fraught, that is important, that we see every day, and that sometimes uh, breaks our hearts with the losses of life um, of unarmed people who face uses of force and have their lives taken from them. There is a, I think, false dialogue that people in black communities don't want law enforcement, don't wanna be safe, that's not my experience. It's not the experience of a lot of people in America. What they want, as I understand it, is to have public safety and human dignity. What they want is to have policing that respects their rights, just like other places have policing that is respectful of their rights. What they want is not to have neighborhoods where crime is unchecked, but what they want is to have their kids to be able to go to school and not be in fear when their teenagers walk out of the house. And so we have to think about this in the context of what the actual goal is, not what the rhetoric is, but what the actual goal is. Similarly, if you're in law enforcement, what you want is for there to be public support and help and assistance in the public safety mission so that there isn't 
and inherent tension and hostility so that if you're trying to solve crimes and get information, you depend on, on public support and information to do your job. You can't do it by yourself. And so to be effective in policing, you need to have some engagement with the community. And so when I think about this, I said, we're gonna go backward and forward. We have in the other two areas, we'll go backward and forward. What, what are the historical underpinnings of, of policing, modern day policing in America? There are some complicated ones. I mean, for one thing, we go back in earlier times and we think about the Fugitive Slave Act. We think about an act that gave power for people to apprehend black people that were believed to be runaway slaves, right? That target black people and put them in harm's way in some sense as people are being apprehended. This is goes back to the 1790s, again in the 1850s, right? These laws that told people that you could grab people because during in, in slavery and before those reconstruction amendments, people were prop, they were they were treated as property, not as people, and their rights weren't respected. And so there's what is the relevance of this context? We'll we'll connect it up. But the other piece of it is that until the 1800s, there were not formal police departments, really. They came around in the, in, the, in the early 1800s. The first, I think, was in London. And there was a guy named Sir, Sir Robert Peel that announced certain principles because there was so much concern about having what was considered like a domestic standing army that was gonna operate against the people. There was so much skepticism of what those powers would be that Robert Peel announced principles that would check and limit and bound the way that law enforcement could proceed. Look them up. If you Google it, you look up Peel's principles, you'll see. And they're principles of democracy, democracy containment, a guidepost that the, that the, the police are the people and the people are the police to, to understand that using the least force possible is the best practice. There's a whole set of these principles. So the early police department, first police department in London, they're needing to make the case about what is gonna be the context in which this police department operates. So Robert Peel talks about it. And then in New York, we get a police department as well. And the police commissioner, a couple of commissioners ago said that he used to carry around these Peel's principles, like in recent times still, that these are the democracy, democratic framework and it provides a framework of accountability. Again, it's not, we don't want law enforcement. We want law enforcement that respects the rights of the people and that, that succeeds in the public safety mission. And these principles are historic and important. And when, they, when, when you read them and you see that, the, that they say that the ability of the police to perform their duties is dependent upon public approval of police existence, actions, behavior, and the ability of the police to secure and maintain public respect. And they go on from there. And so I, I said that this talk was about how civil rights forges democracy. Here from the very inception of what is gonna be the context in which law enforcement is gonna operate, there are concepts of democracy and limitation. There are concepts of accountability and limited powers. And, and part of what we need to do is to come back to it. There's another community principle um, that, that community, you know, sort of the idea of community policing may trace back to, uh, to Peel's principles as well, when you think about it. And so we have to understand the historic um, underpinnings. But when we look at the cases today, and we think about the cases today, we think about Peel's principles, but we think about whether it's George Floyd or Dante Wright or Eric Garner. We think about all of the people who have no weapons but lose their lives. We think about Darnella Frazier, a 17-year-old woman who happens upon what's going on with George Floyd when he's handcuffed and subdued, police are all around. He's having his life literally choked out of him in plain view. And this 17-year-old girl, untrained in advocacy, but with a deep sense of humanity, takes out her camera because she sees that there's something that's not right that's happening before her. And that small move, she was there to buy candy in the store, came out, took out her camera, took that picture. In some ways, it's the most significant footage in American democracy since the Edmund Pettus Bridge. 
where folks were beaten on that day in 1965 that sent the president to the Joint House of Congress. Now the country talks about, are we in a reckoning? Are we in a George Floyd reckoning? And I understand reckoning to mean that you confront something. In order to reckon, it's not just that you talk about it, it's that you do something about it. And so when I hear about a reckoning, I put a question mark after it. I don't assume that because we said it, we did it. Why? Because I know the history. I know that the old battles come back again. We're seeing some accountability in some of these cases. Are we all the way there? No, we're not all the way there. Will there be greater emphasis on law enforcement intervening when one of their own is using excessive force because there will be consequences if you don't do that job? That's possible that we'll see that. Is that better off for everybody? Yes. Why? Nobody wants to stand trial for having murdered a man who could be here today, who should be here today. That doesn't do any good for the police department, doesn't do any good for his family, doesn't do any good for the city. And these cases in which I've been involved, negotiating the consent decree in Baltimore after Freddie Gray's killing, which is to put constitutional guardrails in place when the Department of Justice came in. These cases, in law, you talk about the bet the company case, the big case that's so important, the whole company is depending on it. These are the cases that where you bet the city you bet the democracy, mayors turn over, police commissioners are gone. There is unrest, we've seen it. We saw it in Baltimore, we've seen it here. We've seen it in, in Minnesota. It shakes the city, the state to the foundation. Nobody wants that. And so when we think about these cases, we have to think about a different way. Not that we don't want law enforcement, what we want is law enforcement that respects the rights of the people, where the cooperation leads to greater public safety, not an us versus them warrior mentality, where young people can go out and go to school and walk freely. That's what we want. How do we wrap this up and put all these things together? I wrap it up in this way. The old battles are today's battles. The old battles are today's battles. We have to take a page of history to know what we need to do to navigate today. We have to understand what's happened before. What is the context? What were these fights about? How did we navigate them? How all of these fights, winning them and engaging in them made the country better. I am reminded by an idol of mine who passed away a little over a year ago, Reverend C.T. Vivian, who was part of the group of folks that fought in Selma and led the Selma voting rights efforts. Um, before the march on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, C.T. Vivian went to the courthouse one day, dapper as, as, as you could imagine with his, with his coat on, and he brought a group of African-Americans to register to vote. And he was met at the door by Jim Clark, the same sheriff that would later beat people on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And C.T. Vivian said, I'm here to vote. We're here to, um, to register to vote. We want to register to vote. They were met by the police at the door. Jim Clark said, no, you're not voting. Get out of here, go away. C.T. Vivian pressed the case, said, we're, you know, we're here to vote and we're going to register to vote. Jim Clark becomes so aggravated that he punches in full view of the camera, he punches C.T. Vivian in the mouth and makes him bleed. You know, you can see, knocks him down and he's bleeding. And C.T. Vivian stood up and then said to Sheriff Clark that he's prepared to be beaten for democracy. You know, it's caught on video. We're prepared to be beaten for democracy, is what he said. Um, when C.T. Vivian died at the U.S. Civil Rights Commission, I wrote a tribute to him and his life example, and we passed that unanimously. And C.T. Vivian said, you are defined by the battles that you choose. You are defined by the battles you choose. He said with Sheriff Jim Clark, it was a clear engagement it was a clear engagement. I told you, they knew who this man was. They knew the danger they faced. But again, you're defined by the battles you choose. The NAACP is defined by the battles you choose. You have worked to forge American democracy by being on the right side of political participation, of educational opportunity, of law enforcement and accountability, and the nation is better for it.
I'm here to tell you that it's a long race. Our work is not done. We know that we have to keep fighting, but we're unwavering, we're committed to it, and we won't stop until the union is more perfect. Thank you very much. This morning, Father, we ask that thou would hear the prayers of thy children everywhere, those who are burdened down because of conditions here in America, and those who are confused about how they should treat their fellow man. Oh, God, we ask for those who have hatred in their heart to touch their hearts right now, oh, Father, and somehow fill their hearts with love. And, oh, God, make of this uh, land in which we live be a land of plenty and a land of righteousness. Oh, God, may we recognize this land, a land of freedom for every race. Oh, Father. Six, 